Good morning, everybody. Um, you're, you're, you're probably expecting somebody else, um, but they're all it, doing their winter holidays and in the Poconos and places. So um, I'm Steve Kelly. I'm the director of PPL. And um, I, I'm a bit nervous, actually, um, that I'll mess this up or something. Um, and I'll, I'll hear from Andrew or Arturo um, that I didn't do it as well as they do. Um, Thank you for coming out this morning. It was a beautiful morning, but probably quite hard to get out of your driveway. So um, good on you to make it all the way to the, to, to the lab this morning. Uh, we had a, a special conference call at 6, 6 a.m. this morning to, to, to find out whether we were gonna be able to open this morning and the decision was positive, so that's great. Um, this is the uh, Science on Saturday lecture series, the Ronald Hatcher Science on Saturday uh, lecture series. And, um, uh, do go online um, for the up, upcoming ones. Um, there are bagels. Uh, I don't think there are any donuts left. Uh, th th there are three donuts left. Three donuts. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, um, uh, usually we have, as probably many of you know, a few more people. I think the snow made it very hard for people this morning, but really good to see people. Um, uh, uh, masks are optional. Um, uh, uh, please save your questions to the end. Um, uh, wait for the microphone to come round um, and so that uh, the people online can hear what you're saying. Uh, that's very important. And also so that the, uh, so that the speaker can hear your question. Um, uh, Zoom participants, please make sure your microphone is set to mute. Hold all questions until after the presentation. Use the raise hand, usually a yellow hand, although you can adjust the color of the hand, which I discovered the other day. Isn't that kind of cool? Um, uh, function to ask a question or type your question into the chat. Um, please know that we are recording the talks and the questions, so um, be polite. Um, <laughs> Um, we're very, very um, honored to have um, Wei Peng um, here today. Um, and uh, Wei uh, got her bachelor's from uh, Peking University and then her um, PhD from a university up the street, <laughs> Princeton University. Um, we just discovered actually something very interesting that we both met our spouses at the graduate college at Princeton Mine 43 years ago, yours a little bit more recently than that. Um, it's a good place <laughs> to meet people. Um, she's a, a professor in the university uh, in the Annalinger Center for uh, the Environment and uh, a core faculty member of the Center for Policy Research on Energy and the Environment. Um, uh, her title today is um, I'm not going to read all, uh, everything. Uh, let's see. The title, Decarbonizing the Energy System for a Cleaner and Healthier uh, Future. The future is not there, actually. <laughs> oh, that's a bit what that's a bit worrying, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, wait, do, do come up. So um, as you all know, we always ask three questions at the beginning of this. And the, the first question is, when did you first get interested in, in, in science and in the environment? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I've always kind of liked math, engineering kind of stuff. But when I really started to become interested in doing research is when I was in college, and I was an undergrad in Peking University, and 2008 was the time when Beijing held the Beijing Olympics. And I was very lucky to got involved in a huge research campaign, really figuring out the question, how can we make sure the sky remains to be blue during those two weeks? Yes. And it was, it was like 200 people research team, and they, they worked so hard making sure that we can reduce the emissions, we can do everything we can to protect the air. One thing I really learned from that experience is that protecting the environment to a large extent is about trade-offs. It's, you know, we kind of know how to reduce the emission to zero, right? You just stop all the economic activities, see what we have seen during COVID. 
the real question there is that we cannot do that forever, and the difficult trade-off, thinking about environmental issues, societal issues, equity issues, everything, and how can we use science to better inform those decisions? So that was my like aha moment, like why I want to really start thinking about those the wicked societal problems rather than those math problems. Don't get me wrong, I still like those, but there are wicked problems in the real world that even the perfect math is going, not going to tell us the perfect solution. Wow, that's a, a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, the second question, yes, right, um, is uh, was there a very influential person on your appreciation of of these issues and who was it? Yeah, I think there are a couple, like definitely more than just one. One teacher I really like when I was a middle school student was my geography uh, teacher because she can always draw those like like the maps, the world maps, and the maps for China, and map of my home province, Hunan, just using the chalk on the board. And I was so amazed by that. Um, and the other person that really changed my mind um, in terms of thinking about research in particular is someone I met during my grad school, David Victor, who is a professor at UC San Diego. He's a political scientist. And I love being challenged by him, thinking about why the perfect, why the right thing never get done in the real world and why the model world is always too perfect to be true. So I think those two people really changed my thinking around these issues. You're really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the final question, yeah. what do you do in your spare time? Yeah, so I have a three-year-old. So as you could imagine, that's, it. <laughs> that's, it. that's the end of my answer. Like he's definitely keeping us busy. Um, overly busy, overly entertained in my spare time. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, wait, thank you very much. And uh, please. Um... Thank you. Okay. So I think I pulled on my slides. Here. Okay. So I just talked a little bit about myself. But today, you will be hearing me talking a lot about computational models. Before I do that, I want to start with something more personal. Now you all know that I grew up in China. So I want to start with this question. What was China like 40 years ago? Most of you probably don't remember. Me neither, because I wasn't even born. But this is something I do remember. So I grew up in a city called Changsha in southern China. And about 15 years ago, we got our first international terminal at our airport so that people in my hometown can travel internationally. And about 10 years ago, we got our first train station for high-speed trains. And that was also around the time when we got our first metro line running in the city. Now we have six of them. And Changsha is only a second-tier city in China. If you're looking at a larger city, that was Shanghai in the 1980s and Shanghai today. This really shows how much can be done in 40 years. And this really shows like with the right people, right incentive and right, all doing the right thing, this is the scale of change we can have. But it is not without problems. Because arguably, China has been the world's worst polluter. We have been the global top carbon emitter for more than a decade. And air pollution has been really severe, causing millions of premature deaths every year. And that has also caused a lot of like, public health issues. So what is behind this economic miracle on the one hand and all the sustainability problem we observe? Energy. And for China, mostly coal. So here I'm showing you how the energy, in order to fuel this economic growth, the energy demand, energy consumption has been growing very rapidly over the past 40 years. So did the CO2 emissions. So on the one hand, energy really drives the economic miracle. But on the other hand, because burning coal in particular emit a lot of CO2 emissions, like those greenhouse gases emissions, and also air pollution, it has become a, 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 a driver for many environmental problems we observe. But the past is in the past. The future is more important, even though it, it was missing in my title. So the more relevant question today is what will China be like 40 years from now? But this question, I'm sure nobody knows. 
but we do know the direction because the country has pledged to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. So looking at how the emissions has been going up over the past 40 years, the country will need to completely reverse that trajectory in the next 40 years. And China is not the only country in this race to net zero. For example, the United States and the EU also pledge to reach net zero by 2050, 10 years earlier than, than China. But you can see that um, our emission trajectory has been going in the right direction over the 10 years. What we need to do is to have additional incentive and momentum so that we can get to where we, are, we want like 30 years from now. So I'm sure that you're all asking this question in your mind right now. Can we get there? Unfortunately, I don't have the superpower to predict the future. So as a researcher, I can only tackle this question that I'm more capable of, which is how can we get there? And this is where energy modeling, which is what I do, has become super useful. So using energy models, we can try to understand, hey, with existing policies, let me highlight here, are we on track to bend the emissions curve? But usually the answer is no. Then the question is, what are the additional efforts we need in order to achieve much deeper decarbonization and achieve climate stabilization? So for this reason, energy model has been very helpful to, for us to get a sense, are we on track? And what the additional transformation in energy system will be needed in order to get there? In case any of you came to my colleagues, Jesse Jenkins talks next Saturday, I'm sure you have heard a lot about energy modeling and also cool things that he and the Princeton team has been doing. Today, I wanna to talk about the other side of the model world. So on the one hand, I am very proud of how much the community has been doing to really try to inform decarbonization and, and policy. But on the other hand, there are things that worries me or troubles me from time to time, which is our model focused so much on the technology and much less so on humans. And let me give you one example. So this is, perhaps the kind of charts that you have seen before, maybe even from my colleague Jesse Jenkins talk. So this is just like one representative technology pathway for the world to achieve 1.5 degree stabilization target by the end of the century. So very ambitious climate target. So you kind of can see that this is what we need to do. We need to quickly um, phase down fossil fuel. We also need to quickly phase up renewables. All sounds good. But once you start to put human into the picture, you're going to ask a very different set of questions. On the one hand, given how, rely, how, much, rely, how much we rely on fossil fuel today, can we really face, face out fossil fuel that quickly? And given the institutional bottleneck and in infrastructure need we have, can we scale up renewable that quickly? And on the other hand, people's lives is going to be really changed from this energy transformation. So if we live in a world like with no, almost no fossil fuel, just imagine that world. This is going to change how we drive, how we live, and to many people, their livelihood. So then the question becomes, what does this transition, energy transition really mean to people? And in fact, energy is really at the center of a lot of societal considerations. So it is definitely the core problem for the climate change, but it is also a key issue why we have air pollution, some of the health implications, and also it, it, there's environmental justice and other equity implications because of the way we consume and produce energy. On top of that, climate, to a large extent, it is a more longer term concern. But many of the other considerations, air pollution, health equity, for example, they're more near term. And to a lot of people, worries about global warming is less still pressing than worries about their jobs, their health, and um, the, the, the air in their city. So for this reason, we have been thinking a lot about how can we really align our decarbonization transition with those more near-term considerations so that we're going to hopefully embrace those near-term benefits as we also try to tackle the big and long-term climate challenge. And that's the overarching question that a lot of my group have been thinking about. How can we incorporate air quality and health considerations into energy decarbonization strategies? 
So um, we have been, so in order to do that over the past few years, I have been leading a project called the Health Effects of Deep Decarbonization. So if you wanna learn more, our project website is over there. But really what we have been trying hard to think is that can we put human and can we pu put health at the center when we're thinking about energy transition and the design of the associated policies? In short, what we, what we really hope to do is that there's a cool set of analytical tools that people have been do building around energy modeling, but can we also now put those human impact assessment into the picture so that at the center, we have the right tool to thinking about the decarbonization challenge. So in case, um, there are different ways of doing energy modeling. Uh, one particular tool that I'm going to introduce today is called integrated assessment modeling. In case you have not heard, heard about it, I have just one quick slide, give you a very high level overview about what this tool, what this model is all about. So IAMs, um, integrated assessment models, they usually start with exogenous assumption about, for example, the economic side GDP and demographic side GDP, uh, population, and also the policy target and some of the technology assumptions. And then all of those assumptions are going to go into a central part of the model where a system of systems are going to be modeled. So for example, suppose we have a growing economy in the future, I hope we will, uh, what does it mean for our energy consumption, energy demand? And in order to meet the energy demand, what kind of um, supply technologies we're going to have in order to meet that? And then what does it mean for the emissions and the climate system? And also what is the land requirement associated to support that te technology future? So in short, the center of the system is really try to capture uh, th th that linkages between different systems and putting energy as one, core component of that. And then coming out of the model, we usually have things like economic costs, energy pathways, emissions, land use, et cetera. The other thing I wanna emphasize, given that you know, we focus a lot on energy here, when you're really thinking about those arrows I was talking about just now, you could easily imagine two ways of doing it. One way is that I'm going to use like very highly stylized representation to do it, but um, that's great, but that has been, you know, if you use like very stylized representations, then you cannot really say, hey, should I build the next power plants? What kind of next power plant I'm going to build? And what will be the specific implication it is going to have for people, for example, living in Princeton? So that's not the approach we have been taking. So instead, a lot of our work is really thinking about that second figure I was highlighting there, using detailed process IAM, where we try to really capture those flow of the energy system from what sources, you're, fewer sources you're using, what is the processing and conversion, and also how we can meet the demand coming out of there. Okay, so now that I have just used two slides introducing what is IAM, by the way, I'm offering a course on that in Princeton, so we actually get a semester to talk about those two slides, but I know you folks are super smart, so I hope, hopefully you get what I was talking about just now. Now I wanna start to talking about what do we see as the challenges using the traditional modeling approach to model human impacts. So in my view, there are a few. First of all, IAMs, the models we traditionally use, such as IAMs, are two cores, and they don't really have the right variable when you're thinking about the impact. So for example, traditionally from the model, we get things like global mean temperature, where in reality, we, much, we care much more about the local meteorology. And also, do we have like damage, economic damages associated with disasters or other kind of climate events? The second thing is that the model usually tell us, hey, this is a regional aggregate air pollutant emissions. But we really care much more about local pollution exposure and the health impacts. What does it really mean to me and also my kids? Then the model often also can tell us, hey, this is kind of like roughly the regional total mitigation cost. But ultimately, when we're thinking about a human, we care much more about how that cost and um, are going to be distributed across different regions and also population groups. So in, in my view, that is one thing we need to do much better, which is going from really like force output to the variables and the metrics that really mean something to me as a person. The second thing is where the science come in. So in fact, we're talking about a very complex system where there are very sophisticated relationship between my actions and also the impacts. So here's one such example. So if you're thinking about the global climate, 
it's affected not only by what we do here in Princeton, it's, a, it's also affected what the states are doing, what the United, the country is doing, and also what the world is going to do. So if you're thinking about the climate, it is determined by the aggregate actions from many different levels. However, now that I care about my local impact, and when I'm thinking about local impact, they are also affected by multi-level decisions. So let's just thinking about here, we live here and we care about our air, the air we breathe here, but the air we breathe here is not only determined by what, how much emissions Princeton is emitting, we're also downwind region of Pennsylvania. So we also care about what Pennsylvania is doing in terms of shutting down their coal-fired power plants as an example. And to make it even more complicated, our local meteorology, like when we, how much precipitation we get, when, what kind of wind we get, do we get another, um, for example, impact from wildfire, all these issues are affected by global, global climate. So as a result, there's a complex relationship between like my local, how, how the multi-level action is going to influence my local impact. And this is where a lot of science get complicated very quickly. This is a system where we have multi-level travels, uh, drivers, multi-scale linkages, and it's very hard to do a very good cause-effect relationship, like this is the impact from certain action. Yes, and to make it even more complicated, energy infrastructure often has long lifetime. So if I build a power plant or transmission grid today, I should be thinking about the future because they're going to be there for at least a few decades. So, but at the same time, I know that for the next few decades, the technology is going to change, the social demographic trends is going to change. So how can we build the energy system that would give us good outcome, regardless, given that there are a wide range of future uh, possibility for the future to unfold? So we don't have perfect answers to those challenges we were talking about just now. But what, we, what I hope to do for the rest of my uh, talk today is to give you three very quick examples to demonstrate how my group have been thinking about um, linking those energy side more with the, uh, with the impact side. So the first example I'm going to give today is to thinking about the effects of global climate change, um, climate mitigation, and regional air quality and health. And then we start to ask the question about the robustness under the future uncertainties. So the second example is pretty much the same idea, but now we add uncertainties into that discussion. And the last thing is, um, the, the third question I have here is, you know what, I not, it's not only about the global climate change, it's also about the domestic decarbonization. So, and also we not only care about the air quality, we also care about the disposal disparities regarding the equity implications. So the last example I, I have here is to add in both domestic and global decarbonization and also push us to think a little bit more about those justice implications. So with that, I wanna just use roughly five minutes for each example, but happy to talk more because each of them is my grad students' three years of hard work. So first one, um, traditionally, if you're thinking about what people have been doing, we have already been thinking a lot about how climate mitigation is going to influence energy and, uh, and land use, and also how the social demographic factors like GDP grows, population grows, is also going to influence our energy demand. And because of that, we have, using the models, we can also quantify what are the associated emissions of CO2 um, and also air pollutants. But now that we care much more about health, as I highlight there, as you can see that then we need to add those additional linkages so that we can get the health effects. On the one hand, it's not only about emissions, we wanna take one step further thinking about the population exposure. On the other side, thinking, when we're thinking about social demographic, we also need to start to uh, realize that there is an important part of the equation which is about population vulnerability. So um, if, if you're thinking about people from different social demographic status or different age groups, they, ha they, are they have different vulnerability to the same kind of risk. I think COVID was a good lesson to us, even if it's kind of like the same exposure, but clearly elderly people are more vulnerable and they face higher risk, even the exposure level is the same. Similar things could play out here for air pollution as well. Those people with pre-existing conditions and also kids with asthma, um, they are definitely the people who are more vulnerable to air pollution compared with the rest of the population. 
So once we really have those brown part at being added about population exposure and population vulnerability, we can start to really make the linkage thinking about the health. And this work is led by my grad students, um, um, Hui Yang, and her paper was published last year in Nature Sustainability. I put it up there in case you're interested. So just very briefly, what did we do? So we first used the global IAMs, those kind of traditional models I was talking about just now, to come up with five future scenarios. And those five future scenarios vary in two dimensions. One is the socioeconomic trends and air pollution policy. The other one is, um, so it is about the climate target, ranging from like less warming to much worse warming. And then we um, spend a lot of efforts try to get to the health outcomes. So first of all, once we have the emissions, we need to downscale them to much smaller spatial scale. Uh, and then we put it into the Earth system model, the GFDL ESM model, so that we can get the climate variables and also the projection for the ambient PM 2.5, the fine particular matter in the air that's so small, they can penetrate into your lung and have health consequences. So um, using that model, we were able to get the climate part and also the exp exposure part. But then we also spend a lot of efforts thinking about um, how we can, from that aggregate pattern, getting the downscaled projection for the social demographic side. What does it mean for the total future population, for the aging trend, and also the changes in the base and mortality rate? Because even air pollution is just like one of many reasons why our mortality risk will get increased. And there are like um, the base and mortality rate captures the risk, even if you are even if you don't in, uh, face higher air pollution exposure. So combining all of those, especially your expo the exposure level, the population size, the vulnerability, and the, vul uh, and the uh, base on mortality rate, um, aging and the base on mortality rate, we were able to calculate the health outcome. Here, the indicator I'm going to show today is the premature death. So the, the premature mortality because you face higher air pollution throughout the course of your life. Okay, what did we find? The first key insight we ha have is that with climate mitigation, we find that the pollution exposure is likely to go down in most regions. As you can see from the first map, you see a lot of purple areas over there, and those are the regions where with climate mitigation, we, we project that the air pollution exposure level is going to go down. However, we see a different pattern for the house burden as you can see from the uh, map on in the bottom, we still see like a lot of oranges around the world. Um, that's where the PM 2.5 attributable debt as a metric for the house burden may go up despite the decreasing exposure. My guess is that you probably are thinking about, hey, maybe that's because we have more people living on this planet by the end of the century. That was our guess initially as well. But then what we realized is that, you know what, it's not only about population size, actually popula population vulnerability is playing a more important role. So what we find as the second insight is that population aging and declining based on mortality rate will play a more important role than population growth or exposure change itself. This is one such example. So what we show here is the comparing the end of the century to today, what is the relative contribution for each of the factor in changing the total death burden by, uh, throughout that time. So what you can see here, um, the, or you can see that all the bar, the, the orange bar and the blue bar here really stand out. And the orange bar is the effect of aging. So basically take India as an example, what this figure shows tells you is that because we project that the, the aging will be a big issue for India, there will be more elderly people living in India by the end of the century, and they're more vulnerable to air pollution, if we hold everything else the constant, the effect of aging is going to increase the PM 2.5 concentration by 1,000%, which is 10 times. Um, and, 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 but, but luckily, a lot of those effects um, is counteracted by that blue bar, and that's the declining base the mortality rate. So basically, you, but what empirically what people have found is that as countries grow wealthier, they usually have in, it also improved their healthcare conditions, and the base and mortality rate is going to go down as well. So those are the two much two bigger uh, 
factor um, that's going to play a role comparing with some of the, the other two colors. One is gray. This is to show that, yes, by the end of the century, the exposure level is going to go down to the PM2.5 concentration. Uh, and the yellow over there shows that, yes, if you have like more people by the end of the century, then yes, you're going to also get an, an increase in the PM2.5 attributable death. So if I can just use one sentence to summarize what we find in this, in this analysis, it's really about population vulnerability. We have spending so much time trying to understand how the, what the energy transition is going to mean for our exposure level, but now it's time for us to also thinking about what does it mean for population expo uh, vulnerability. So that's, that concludes my first example. Happy to take questions um, at the end of my talk. So the second example um, I want to talk about is now introducing the future uncertainties. So the pre, in the, in, from the previous example, I, I hope we, um, we kind of show that yes, if we have climate mitigation, we're going to displace fossil fuel and that's going to um, get us health benefits. But once you start thinking about really like decarbonized future, we also need to start thinking about those emerging health risks from large scale mitigation. So for example, there are people finding that if we really tackle climate change by having much more biofuel use, then we need land to grow those bio crops and that might compete with agricultural uses and that might even worsen the food insecurity in the future. So, and on top of that, you see, when we, we, as we transition from the, the health benefits to the emerging health risk side, the future uh, uncertainty will play a very important role in thinking about like what kind of future we're going to end up with. And this work and, and incorporating that future uncertainty and start to thinking about that emerging health risk is the work led by my other grad student, Xingyuan Huang, and his paper was published last year as well. Okay, so this, the methodology we use here is very similar to the previous one. So let me just highlight what's new. Remember in the previous example, I gave you only five scenarios, but we know that the future has much more variation or uncertainty comparing with those five. So what we did here is that we start to expand the plausible futures that we can explore. So we start with one decision lever, which is just carbon price, but then we combine that with seven type of different uncertainties that people have found to be crucial when thinking about sustainability future, such as socioeconomics, energy demand, fossil fuel costs, CCS costs, um, et cetera. And by combining that decision lever and also the uncertainties, we end up having an ensemble of uh, almost like 28 point, um, yeah, it's basically nearly 30,000 scenarios over there. And with this like very large scale scenario ensemble, we then do something very similar to the previous example where we assess the implications on the emissions and also on the health side, and also started thinking about some of the regional distribution stuff. The key thing here is that traditionally, we have been focusing more on this green pathway, which is to say that, hey, if we mitigate climate change, we're going to reduce fossil fuel and we're going to reduce air pollution emissions and that's going to bring us health benefits. However, it is possible that there might be emerging risk coming up. And, and the, here, the red arrows here show some of those examples. So if we really um, mitigate climate change by increasing our bioenergy use, that might directly increase the air pollution emissions because of biomass combustion. It may also really change the way we grow biomass and as a result, disrupt the land use pattern, and that will also have emissions implications. So really this work is all about if we have a considering that wide range of plus of future under what conditions we will likely see very robust co-benefits like that green is going to dominate and are there conditions we're going to see those red, those like co-harm may potentially occur. This is what we find. So our first finding is that we do find consistent health co-benefits in most countries. So that is indicated by a lot of like blue areas you can see here. Um, those are the areas where we find that even among all those like, um, like uh, we, we have nearly 30,000 scenario, that's essentially 40 pairs of scenarios with or without carbon price. And in all those sets, we find robust health benefits in all those regions highlighted in blue. 
However, we do see some areas where in a, very, in a subset of those scenarios, like 30,000 scenarios, there might be increases in uh, PM2.5 attributed death rate occurred. So in other words, we actually see worse health outcome because of the carbon tax. And those regions are highlighted with the gray lines over here. As you can see, like United States in that category, like um, um, Russia, Canada, and some of the so so uh, Southern uh, so South America regions are in that region as well, in that category as well. So the, then the question becomes why? Why there are um, why the so for those subset of scenarios where we do see like co harms occur, what is the underlying mechanism that lead to their results? So the short answer is that that pathway for house co harms to evolve to to occur involve really complex interactions between sectors and regions. I'm going to show you a very complex figures. Um, but no need to read through everything. I just want to use that as a way to highlight the, the um, pathway that I'm going to show on the left. So in short, this is a pathway. If we have a higher carbon price as, the, as a proxy for carbon mitigation, we're going to increase the bioenergy use as a result, even though, yes, at the same time, we reduce a lot of coal throughout a lot of world regions. And because of that, we see reduction in a lot of precursor emissions, such as sulfur dioxide, thanks to the reduction in coal use. But because of that increase in bioenergy use, we actually see some type of emissions, such as organic carbon, that's going to go up. And that has something to do with land competition, deforestation, and the organic carbon emissions coming out of burning down the trees. Because of that, since the ambient PM2.5 concentration ultimately respond to different type of precursor emissions, then what we find is that there are regions far on the left where because things that see as the reduction in SO2 emissions is always so large, we always see a lot of reductions in the concentration of PM2.5, whereas there are like other regions where we start to see a small increase in the particular matter concentration largely because of that increase in organic carbon. And finally, that translates into our health risk, as, as shown as the changes in PM2.5 death rate. So using the, this example, if I can just use one sentence to summarize, the key thing is there might be unintended consequences as we start to tackle climate change, but those things might not be do I have one more slide? Yes. But those things might not be, uh, we, we can largely avoid those uh, unintended consequences. And here's one such example. Remember I said just now that yes, there are um, uh, regions where we might see an increase in the PM2.5 attributable death rate, basically the health risk. There's one thing you can do that you can completely eliminate that health co-harm. And that example is changing your deforestation approach from open burning to clear cutting. So if you do that one thing, we're going to change from the blue um, arrow is blue box plus to the gray box plus. And you can see that now all the gray are below zero, essentially saying that we're eliminating those house co, co harms. And we now can, for all the regions, we can start to embrace house co benefits. So that concludes my second example. I think I'm doing all right. Now I'm gonna go to the last example. Um, and that's really motivated by the fact that, yes, regional air quality might matter. Like that's really the focus for the previous two example. But we also care a lot about the exposure disparities and also how we can combine our domestic and global efforts to improve the equity outcome. So, if we start to thinking about exposure disparities, that's essentially just to, at a very high level, this is just a simple relation, correlation between two things. One is where the pollution is high, the other is where the disadvantaged populations live. And once we start to really thinking about that and, and, and put energy transition or decarbonization into the picture, where there are both global decarbonization and domestic decarbonization will influence where pollution might be high in the future. Because the domestic decarbonization efforts will change the energy system, as a result, changing the emissions pattern. And the global decarbonization is going to influence our global climate and also local meteorology. 
So both of those two mechanisms will influence where the pollution is high. But where the disadvantaged populations live has a lot to do with those very fine-scale socioeconomic trends, where like urbanization, migration, it's that, and also the um, healthcare system Im improvement, all those things will start to matter and influence that where disadvantaged populations live. So in short, in this work, um, this work has not been published yet, so I will only um, show preliminary results, but it's led by my postdoc, Peng Fei Wang. And his picture is over there. Okay, how exactly do we put things together? So um, the key things, the two key efforts we try to capture here, one is the global decarbonization efforts, the other is domestic decarbonization efforts. So for the global one, we have just two cases. One is very ambitious global action. The other is very limited global action. And then you, by using a climbing model, we get the climate meteorological conditions that um, reflect how your action is going to influence the future climate and meteorology. And the second one is domestic decarbonization efforts, where we have the reference case where we assume very limited action. We also have another case where we assume net zero um, emissions by 2050, and we use a state-level integrated assessment model, GCAM USA, to get our state-level emissions, and then we downscale that to the gridded emissions. By combining those projected meteorolo meteorological conditions and the projected emissions, we put them into an uh, atmospheric chemistry and physics um, uh, transport model, WORFCAM, so that we can simulate the ambient concentration of particular matter and ozone. And finally, combining that with county level social demographics, we can start to thinking about the question about exposure disparities. What did we find as a preliminary result? So the first thing we find is that the domestic decarbonization efforts can indeed lower future pollution level, but we kind of find evidence that the current exposure disparity may exist if we just decarbonize in, in, in a traditional way. This is what I mean. So what I show here, let's just use the left one as an example. This is the annual mean um, PM 2.5 concentration. What you find here is that um, the, um, the, this one, the high income regions, generally income household, generally um, face, uh, this, the low income household gen generally face higher pollution levels comparing with the solid one, which is, um, uh, yes, low income, household generally face higher pollution level than the high income household. That's, yeah. and that's what basically the pattern in 2017. And if you look into the future, you can see that the whole, this is better. You, you can see that the exposure level are all changing from right to left, essentially meaning that the general pollution pattern is going to go down. But if you're looking at the relative location, for that um, solid blue and the halo blue, you're going to see that we actually see potentially that exposure disparity to persist, even in a decarbonized world. And um, it's interesting to notice that the ozone pattern is exactly the opposite. And this is also consistent with a lot of other people have found. For ozone, people generally find that the high income region, actually high income household actually have higher exposure to ozone concentration. And the main reason there is about urbanization because usually ozone concentration are higher in the urban regions. And a lot, the, if you're just looking at the average, then the urban, uh, urban household um, will have a, on average, higher um, income level as a result, really showing the results here. But the other thing we have found is that the global decarbonization efforts, because they can influence the meteorological conditions, can have very large impacts on the exposure disparities. So this is my previous results. Now I'm adding one more line. And the, this line, everything is the same as the other net zero case. The only change here is that we are changing um, the climate conditions as a result of really limited global decarbonization efforts. So as you can see, we start to see, especially for the PM 2.5 results, the, dis the exposure disparity starts to like become really close between that uh, lowest and highest decile of the, ho uh, the household income groups. And some of the disparity results will also become very different when we're looking at um, the, the race results as well. So because these are preliminary, and I have to say that when we started this 
uh, project, we were hoping to look for something more concrete. So it would be great if there's a news title from New York Times that's going to say, hey, decarbonization is going to improve equity or something like that. What we actually find from this analysis is that the relationship is so complex and we probably want to be a little bit cautious whenever we want to make an equity conclusion about decarbonization. And this is what I mean. So when we think, it, so first of all, the pollution pattern has a lot to do with how we project the fine scale pattern of future emissions. And that means where, what kind of facilities we're going to add into the future and where those facilities are going to be. So today, the emission hotspots are mainly in the places we have dirty, like coal base, power plants or industrial facility. They might be gone by 2050 with decarbonization, but we'll be adding new. And where are we going to add those new facilities, how clean they are? This will influence those fine scale pattern of emissions. And also, we need fine scale, think about fine scale spatial pattern for future wind, boundary layer height, and rainfall patterns. And that has been super hard, really, to get a very good handle of from global modeling to region, uh, global modeling of the climate system to the regional modeling of the meteorology conditions. On the social demographic side, there's so much uncertainties regarding like migration, urbanization, economic development, and also if we put like healthcare into the whole picture, it's going to even it's going to become even more difficult to project. And finally, the other thing we find really confused, not confusing, but really complicated is that your space how you are thinking about equity also matter. Right. Are you thinking about expo are you assessing your exposure ex uh, disparity at the county scale or at the census tract scale or at the neighborhood scale? Do you really more thinking about income effect or race effect? Depending on how you define equity, many times you're going to get different conclusions or about the exposure disparities. So if I can just summarize one um, in one sentence, what we find from this like long process trying to search for something concrete is that unfortunately we didn't really find that. And methodologically, we actually find model choice and assumptions matter a lot when we're thinking about the equity assessments. This is my last slide. So I hope the examples I gave just now give you a flavor of some of our thinking about linking energy transition with human impact. If I can just summarize everything I say into two sentences, I think we need much more focus on human-centered decarbonization strategies, and our models need to get real about people. With that, I also want to take this opportunity to thank my research group and also my key collaborators and our funders to make this work possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was that was excellent. We have um, microphones uh, going around. Um, Britt is bringing them around right now. So uh, we have a question right there. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, thanks for your presentation. If you went back to slide twenty nine, I don't understand it. When I look at I, I look at um, yeah. China versus Canada, yes. and you talk about Canada being in a uh, end up in a worse situation, uh, having lived there for ten years, I, I really don't understand that slide. Yeah, yeah, um, great question. As I, I I gave the heads up that this is the most difficult slide I have. Thank you for the question, so that I get an extra time to explain it. So uh, let's just focus on Canada. So I want to I want to explain the results in two ways. One is what is happening in the modeled world and what is happening in the real world. So let me start with what is happening in the model world. What is happening in the model world is that the world it's supposed it, all the countries is going to uh, increase their reliance on bioenergy uh, in order to get to decarbonization. But then there's a question about which world region is going to produce or uh, grow that bio crop in order to meet the demand. In the model world, it makes assumption that there's a global market for bioenergy. And because in Canada, the model thing, there are a lot of like all managed forests. So there will be very limited cost to burn down those forests and turn it into a way you can grow bioenergy crops. 
So that's the key reason why in this results here, Canada show up as the region where a lot of like um, bioenergy production and deforestation is going to occur as a result the changes in organic carbon emissions. But I think the other part of your question is about, yes, I explained the model results, but it, does it have some truth in reality? So I think that's a question mark. Um, there are like many reasons why it is a question mark. The first thing is um, we don't really have a global market for bioenergy, simply put. So uh, many times we still see a lot of like bioenergy being produced locally and consumed locally. That's one thing. The other thing is that do we really, uh, even if Canada is going to pursue, um, go going to become the major bioenergy producer for the world, are they going to burn down their forest? There are a lot of reasons they're not going to do it. So this is another, I think this is a great question in a way that once you start to deeper and start to look deeper and deeper into the model world, you're going to see those detach between your model, the, the model world and the real world. And that's also why that's really the overarching theme of my, my talk today, that once we take a closer look, we're going to see what assumptions really matter and how can we start to put more realism into the model. Do I now answer your question? So many more questions coming out of that. Yes. You know, because it's also people are looking to reduce deforestation. And so that yes. runs completely counter to what you just said is Canada being a source for biomass. Yes. And I don't yes. even then how do you define biomass? Oh, to... it's um there are two I think there are two questions of that. One is is the scale of deforestation realistic? So um remember we did 30,000 scenarios. And not all of the scenarios are equally likely to happen. So there are scenarios where we have much less deforestation, and there are scenarios where we have much more deforestation. So um, if you really start to put the realism views, looking at the historical deforestation rate, then you can say that there are certain scenarios that's more realistic than the others, might not be some of the extreme cases here. But I think there's another part of a question, which is, um, uh, then where they do get do they get the land for bioenergy, right? Is that the, the other part? So the basic idea is that I think that what the model is forcing the system to do is that they're going to burn down the forest, so the land is being cleared up. Then you are going to choose what is the what is the profitable way of using your land, and because there's a in the model there's a global market for bioenergy. And, and because the, there's a you know for example other regions like India and China is going to buy it and also use that as a cheaper way to decarbonize. So we're going to, is it is actually more economic efficient to, we can, uh, it's not profitable to turn those deforestated land after deforestation into bioenergy land and then ship them over to the rest of the world. Whether or not it's a realistic is a different story. Let's see. Wait, wait, we... sorry. sorry, what is bioenergy? Define what it, what's growing for bioenergy. Yeah, it, it is, um, a, it's a, it's, there are a few things. There are bio um, biofuel, the bio crops being used in the transportation sector. There are also like wood pellets being used in the residential sector. There are also like biomass being the used in transportation sector. I was using biomass as an umbrella term for all those bioenergy use in the three sectors. Is that corn? I mean, I'm trying to understand what is it? What product? Uh, ethanol. Ethanol is part of it. Corn. Yeah, ethanol corn. Yeah. Uh, how about right here? Well, yes. Hi, thank you for your talk. My, my. Oh, I'm sorry. We have two people. Oh, I can go. Yes. Well, mine is like a continuation of her question yes. in a way because I'm puzzled and worried that this. You focus a lot on bioenergy, biomass, and to me, organic material is is a less concentrated form of. Yeah. Of fossil fuels. So you're still creating carbon dioxide, which is still contributing to global warming. Granted, you may be, uh, be reducing, well, I don't know how much you're reducing, yeah, yeah. actually, some of the other emissions that cause pollution and problems. Yeah, yeah. But to me, it's not an answer to the, to the, to the future question of how to reduce yes. carbon emissions. I, I, I hear you. I think um, this is an interesting study because remember, I, I say that we have 30,000 scenarios. And there are only a subset. So you can achieve the same decarbonization result without bioenergy. You can achieve that with, you know, for example, wind, solar, electric vehicles, and other technologies as well. So I, I, what I was hoping to say is that, we, uh, like, w under what conditions we're going to have, like, bad outcomes. 
And you're absolutely right. Those scenarios that we rely more on bioenergy are indeed the world where we are going to have worse outcomes, both in terms of the air pollution and also in our carbon outcomes. So I'm not advocating for bioenergy. What I'm trying to show here is that, yeah, there are 30,000 scenarios. The, the scenarios with the most problems are the scenarios using more on bio, you depend on more on bioenergy. Do I now answer your question? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a very tricky interpretation once you have 30,000 scenarios about the future. Okay, we have an, another question up over there. Okay, so uh, is one of the uh, advantages of biomass and biofuels that you could do carbon capture on them and actually extract carbon out of the environment and then put it into the ground, yeah. for example? Yeah, so I wish um, we can invite a bioenergy expert to this talk in the future. I'm not, so I will just say what I understand about the system. So we we can put, um, so there are like different ways you can do it. So for example, you can combine coal and biomass do gasification, and then you can put CCA onto it. So capture the relevant, uh, capture the CO2, and then if you think carefully about how you source your bioenergy, it can be negative emissions. So they're like, although, uh, so this is mainly the strategy people have been pursuing for the power sector. There's also biorefinery where there are already like low hanging fruits regarding how you capture those CO2 and then um, thinking about where you store them. So in short, I think bioenergy, <laughs> um, not sure where you, you have this question, but if you have been following the IPCC report, you're going to see a lot of scenarios where ultimately they rely on what we call bags, bioenergy with CCS in order to reach up decarbonization. I have a lot of concerns about that um, because a lot of those technologies are not commercially proven to be feasible today. But in the model world, um, if you assume it's going to be viable by 2030, it will come online in 2030. Yes, I think we have a suggestion here for a talk in this series uh, next time. So <laughs> <laughs> this question here. Um, the well, the first one is I think you have a slides uh, on like uh, the reduction based on the public like a different country like Indian and yeah. others. So I saw that the a in terms of population, right? I mean the effect is yeah. very small. I mean aging yeah. is considerably large. Yeah. Um, I know that the you know Indian population probably by twenty seventy is gonna probably exceeding. Uh, seven, uh, one point seven billion. I mean, yeah. now is it actually bigger than China? Do you really think that effect is that small? I mean, in the in the model. Yeah. So great question. So um, I'm showing one of the as you can see, I'm showing one of the more extreme cases here. There are two extreme part of this figure. One is that I'm showing the result by the end of the century, comparing with today. And that world look very different, especially thinking about aging. I think in India, it's projected like eighty percent. Like seventy to eighty percent of people will will be will be sixty five or up. So that's a world very different comparing with the age structure that India experienced today. If you're looking at twenty fifty, then the effect of aging is going to be you know, the age structure will be very different. That's one thing. Um, the other thing I, I guess what you are saying is that why the yellow is very slow. I think the reason that yellow is very slow is because I'm comparing them to the other factors, right? So if um, if I show the same figure for a different scenario and also for a more near term, like 2050, where we actually have more confidence about, I'm sure that the um, the yellow probably will be larger than the other ones. But this is the extreme case in 2100. And this is also SSP1. That's the scenario where we assume the world is going to like prop, is going to grow very rapidly. So with good health, uh, good economic growth and healthcare system, you're going to see two effects happening at the same time. One is people live longer. So you actually have more aging problem. And also you're going to have lower baseline mortality rate because people have better health care. So that is why that orange and that blue will both grow um, in a, if you assume very well economic growth. Yeah, thank you. I think that makes sense. I mean, if I could quickly ask, I think yeah. all, all lot of models here seem to be very complex and uh, there's a lot of input output. And yes. I'm, I'm wondering like nowadays with, with the AI models or deep learning, uh, would yeah. be able to actually utilize the data to learn those models right, okay. rather than to yeah. model it? Great question. The key challenge for people in my field is about how can we use historical data to project for the future? So there, we have been, uh, if you're really thinking about machine learning algorithm, we have been using that a lot for near-term projections. You're absolutely right. 
especially in the air quality side, on the energy side, machine learning has really transformed the modeling technique to a large extent. We haven't really figured out as a community, how can we really leverage machine learning for 2050 or 2100 projection? Right, is that world is going to be very different and also whatever empirical data you use over the past 10 years might not be relevant for 2050 or 100. So the underlying mechanism will be so different and we don't really know how much machine learning can help. Um, it's not to say no, I think it's just to share with you the struggle in terms of the mismatch here. Uh, that's interesting because uh, the, one of the questions online was from Shang Kong Mu from Georgia Tech who asked pretty much the same uh, about yeah. the role of data science and machine learning in your research in a broader energy and sustainability field? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think in my view, there are, this is a great question, and maybe I can take a step back and, and just share my thought on what I see as the two biggest problems when we have 2050 time horizon, but we, we, we still need to make models useful for that long-term horizon. In my view, there are two big challenges. The first challenge is thinking about the social political side. So we kind of can model the energy system very well, but we do a much worse job when, in thinking about policy representations and also, you know, if you if you have changing technology, if you have the, if you have changes in technology system, that will also change people's preferences, and also changes what kind of policies will be more or less favorable by 2050. So we are doing very poor on that because there is just like growing qualitative evidence from the social science about policy support, political feasibility, uh, policy preference, et cetera. We haven't done enough, in my view, thinking about how to incorporate those qualitative evidence so crucial for society decision into our quantity modeling framework. And the second question issue is probably more relevant to this. And I think it's a fundamental question about how can we use historical data to project for long-term future when we know that the future is going to be very, very different. So uh, there's a very famous like figure in my field, like how the energy models always under predict the growth in wind and solar. <laughs> Do you, have you seen that figure before? I, I should share with you folks next time. So it's like over the past two decades or so, we, owe, we constantly under predict how much wind and solar will come online. And I think that's on the one hand, I, I kind of understand why, because you know, you, um, Usually um, on, on, on the modeling side, you wanna add realism to the model and you're using the data over the past five years, of course, you're going to miss the, miss the uh, uptake that is right, right happening. But I think what is more fundamental here is that suppose you had, think about that world in 2050 where there will be like, we reach net zero, we have very limited fossil fuel, then we, are, we will be all relying on wind, solar, electric vehicles, heat pumps, all those new technologies. And we're talking about the scale that there's really no historical value we can refer to. In my view, that's a fundamental challenge in terms of how to do forward-looking model for the decision relevant, um, relevant horizon. So I'm not really answering the question, but I wanna be very candid about what I see as the key challenges, leveraging those like really cool machine learning and other tools into what we do. I think you've been waiting a long time to ask your question. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, excellent presentation, just as a heads up. Uh, and it got me thinking in terms of layman, uh, uh, the new age technologies, like you just mentioned, uh, electric vehicles, or even I've heard blockchain, they do have unintended consequences yeah. of it, which is yeah. what you were trying to bring out. Exactly. Have you done any modeling around that? And can you speak a little more, say... Yes on electric vehicles and what yes. are the unintended consequences yes. or maybe even blockchain and what are the unintended consequences? Yes. I haven't done anything on blockchain, but we have done a lot on electric vehicles. I think there are things we, there are problems that will gradually go away naturally, but there are problems that probably need more work. So in my view, the problem will naturally go away from electric vehicles is what people always say that, hey, you reduce emissions in the, in the transportation sector, but you end up generating more electricity. And when you produce more electricity, you're, you're going to get more emissions of both air pollutants and CO2. That problem, in my view, is the problem that will gradually go away because we do spend a lot of time as a society and also in the research community thinking about how we can decarbonize in the grid. 
So that problem, if you're looking at right now, there are a lot of places, for example, Pennsylvania, where I spent the past five years, we are going to see the marginal change right now. If you use more electric vehicle, it's going to dispatch more natural gas and coal-fired power plants. As a result, you do see like marginal increase in emissions. But I'm not going to worry, overly worry about that because we see the scaling of the electric vehicles and the decarbonizing the grid as concur concurrent efforts together. So my hunch is that by 2050, if we are on track to do both in the two sectors, that problem is going to go away. What I see as the problem that we need to think more about around electric vehicles is about mining and the refining of the minerals. And we actually have a paper that is in the making right now, thinking about, especially for countries like China and India, they, um, you know, um, first of all, two countries are different because <laughs> China is largely dominating the critical mineral supply chain these days. But no matter what, uh, uh, there's a lot of emphasis right now about like increasing the, um, uh, onshoring the supply chain, like increasing the domestic manufacturing and mining activities. And then it becomes, the question becomes, okay, when we get, when we try to get those critical minerals, uh, are we also cleaning up? the water pollution, the air pollution issues associated with that process. So in my view, that's not that's the problem that we can overcome, but I don't think it has received sufficient attention comparing with the huge attention we have put on the power sector emissions coming uh, as associated with electric vehicles. Great, thank you. And I was actually thinking about the mining part as yeah. well. So there isn't enough study as per your suggestion that we've done enough of analysis of what that might mean so to the environment i think this goes back to the question i was talking about just now like we are always looking at the marginal change and in fact we are much better at quantifying the marginal change but what is in my view more important is to thinking about that 2050 world that we will only sell and buy electric cars and we're not talking about we're really talking about building that global supply chain for ev from scratch to a large extent, and it's going to be a very different scale of many activities right now. So I do think we, we have a fair understanding about the marginal effect, but I don't think we have sufficient understanding about that fundamental impact, like how, how we can take a step back, starting from the end point, and then to thinking about what, how to think about how, how to design the supply chain in a way that we can meet that huge demand at the same time, not having those unintended environmental consequences. Does that make sense? So we have we know something, but I think the bigger question is the unknown. What well, one of the big areas of research for the Department of Energy is to find substitute materials yeah. for all those critical minerals, because cobalt, for instance, in in batteries, um, obviously lithium supply is is in things, but it's also the rare earths, which are much rarer, um, and finding uh, technologies that replace them yeah. with. It be easily found um, minerals that are easier to mine or uh, whatever. Yeah. Question. I, I I had two questions. I'll ask them both, and you can answer them. Sure. First, uh, firstly, uh, how well can you measure the carbon emissions from any country? Yeah. Uh, and is that something you can measure annually? And then sec second question was, you had these 80 variables you were modeling, and then you presented the results for one of them in that complicated chart, right? <laughs> Uh, my question was, what would be quite useful is given a particular country, like say India or China or Canada or whatever, if you can model its socioeconomic situations and then say, what is the recommendation you have based on those 80 variables, which one you would recommend to them? Yeah, yeah. And can you correlate it to what they're doing by the annual measurements? Great question. Uh, first question about measuring CO2 emissions. So there is a huge community effort thinking about emission inventory building an emission inventory for greenhouse gases, including CO2. Um, what I can, I, I can talk forever about that, but I think the short answer is that we have a much better understanding about the emissions coming from the energy sector, much less confidence about the emissions coming from the land use sector. And there's so much connected. And of course, it's not going to be a surprise to you. We have a better, we, we always, always have better data for United States and European countries, because the US EPA, as an example, is really like collecting that data continuously over time, so that we do have a fairly good data about that. If you're looking at countries like Africa, it's really at a different scale of data collection monitoring um, stage. So um, that's a long way to say we do now have the global emission inventory for the CO2 emissions, but I do wanna highlight the, for example, the energy part is more certain than the land use part, 
and the advanced economy data is much better than the developing world. So that's my answer to the first question. Your second question is a great one because I, I, I'm moving more and more towards thinking about um, sub-national and national modeling because they are going to be more useful than the global type of analysis when, when, if our goal is to really to inform the decisions. And I was trying to get to some of that in my last example, focusing on the United States, because I really think that's the kind of modeling that would be useful. So you do need to have the sub-national representation, US, China, India, uh, you name a country. But I do think it's important to uh, combine that with the global linkages because these days, like things are connected, you are going to miss a lot if you only do a subnational modeling. And you're absolutely right that if you uh, take China and India as an example, air pollution is a much greater concern over there. And there's sufficient evidence that, you know, you know what, you can't largely clean up the air in India and China without changing the way you use energy. Right? You can't just put sulfur scrubbers on power plants. You can have emission, more emi stringent emission control on your vehicles. And in fact, those are actually more cost-effective ways to reduce emissions today, comparing with shifting completely away from fossil fuel for those countries. So I think those country-specific contexts and also building sub-national modeling in that context is a, is a crucial point. And I think the community is moving towards that, just not fast enough, in my opinion. Thank you. We have a Question right here. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, in one of your last figures with the, um, where you talked about like the median household income, yeah. how did you, like what factors did you use to predict that? And what can we do to kind of yeah, yeah. make that gap smaller? So uh, great question. So I think the first thing I wanna say here is that the, the way we did the um, county ranking is not based on projection. Right now, the data here, I think we just used the 2020 census data. So we're not saying, you know, what countries will be richer or poorer in 2050 and map that. We are really just using the, the, the current data. But I guess the bigger question is why we choose to do that. The main reason is that we have to find a good way to make that fine scale projection for 2050. So, so instead, we, we took a took approach to say to, to more about, hey, our analysis show some potential trends in 2050 and look at our results. If your county is richer or poorer, just based on the GDP level today, then this might be the impact you might anticipate. So that's, um, did that answer your question? Because I, I think, you know, we did not really do projection. That's a great, great point because we haven't found a way to do like really county level projection in a very good way. We for, have, for social economics. We have one question that I really should have looked at because it's online in two places. It says, thank you, Dr. Peng. Uh, it's from Vilas Anavabarapu. Um, do we have strategies to address PM that isn't carbon? Yeah, I, I just gave some examples because uh, I think here in this country, we are actually a very good example where we largely address our particular matter issue without changing the way we use energy. We're solving our climate problem, right? Thanks to Clean Air Act, since then, there are a lot of efforts to shift away from coal. And there's also shale gas boom in this country, which accelerate the transition from coal to natural gas. And natural gas is much cleaner from air pollution perspective than coal. So that's a long way to say, I think there, we know how to, in, in fact, we know how to mitigate emissions. Uh, air pollution emissions without really addressing the carbon problem. Um, but I see what is more challenging is that now for countries, so United States, EU, to, to a large extent, solved one soft air pollution problem, and now they take, they're, they're take on the next one, which is climate. I do not think for the countries like China or India and African countries, they have the time to solve one problem and wait and then solve the other. So that's the, the reason why a lot of our work is really trying to emphasize, can we see alignment so that the country can achieve both goals simultaneously? It's not because we don't know how to do one very well, it's just because I don't think we have time to wait. We've worked you very hard, so one last question, okay? Um, a gentleman right at the back there. Thank you very much for your talk. I, I'd like to go back um, to something that ties off of the second person who you said at the beginning influenced your your current um your, your work so David Victor? Mm -hmm. um when i when i think about other things like human nature we don't like delayed gratification when i think about mass sociology economic structures that are set up to cause businesses to make decisions based on profits that they can glean where they won't have to bear the cost yeah. a huge thing in the fossil fuel industry yeah. um 
there, there's so many, th you, get, you have individual senators who make money off of the fossil fuel industry, hence they can hold up progress and, li and litigation and uh, legislation. Yeah. Um, the, the tie between, or the disparity, pardon me, between modeling yeah. and real world. Um, could you expound a little more about your thinking on that area? Yeah. How a realist can still be optimistic, given yeah. human nature? So, that's a great question. So I, I have a lot of thought about that. So I think my first reaction is that I'm a little bit reluctant to see political always political factors always as a barrier. Because that's a, that's a very pessimistic view, view, in my view, because we really thinking about the, of course, there's a politics. And I think, you know, a lot of people like myself don't really like politics, but there are a lot of like things that's political economy, which is realistic. It's really, it's, and it makes sense. It's about, you know, they're winners and they're losers from the transition. And of course, so if you're thinking, thinking about the coal mining industry versus the green industry, you're going to see very clearly that one industry is losing, one industry is winning. And of course, the losing industry is going to suffer from the transition and they're going to try very hard to see how they, their people, their, they have their family, how they can also thrive or survive through this transition. So if you really don't talk about politics, but talking about political economy, I really think that those are real concerns. And that's the reason why I, I personally think I benefit so much working with people like David Victor, who are political scientists, because they really push me to thinking about building the political economy into the strategy we have, right? So one thing we have been doing right now is that looking at, I think my maybe my colleague Jesse Jenkins talked about this last um, last week, but we have the Inflation Reduction Act here in the United States, and that's that creates a lot of opportunities, subsidies, for example, to um, grow green industry. Then the next, and this can potentially be a political strategy as well. This, I'm just making this up because we don't really know yet. We just have two years of Inflation Reduction Act. But suppose this can really like grow the green industry so that making that coalition stronger in the future. And suppose this can really create more public support for those green energies, then potentially by 2030, we're going to see a very different political, social political foundation for that. So we are really doing some work along those lines, thinking about what we call policy sequencing. Essentially, you start with subsidies, so that's those kind of like industrial policies, but at the same time, make technologies cheaper and make people like, like make the green industry st in, ground, uh, stronger over time. And can that open the door for the next phase of policies such as carbon, carbon tax or other kind of regulations more plausible into the future? So in short, I see a lot of like pessimism, especially whenever you talk about climate and you talk about politics, but I tend, especially, you know, I'm a modeler, I have to be optimistic. And I, I kind of think that there is there, there is at least one way we can make this narrative more useful, which is how can we more actively to build those kind of winners and losers story and those kind of like political economy story into our strategy, because sometimes it's not necessarily a trade-off. There might be a win-win situation where we just like don't do that when we try to like minimize the cost in the model or optim uh, like increase the total welfare in the model. There might be something more we can do once we start to thinking about objective function as a society and as a model differently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank That's you. actually, uh, I think, an optimistic way to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've heard you talk three times every time I learn something new. So thank, thank you, you very, very much again. Thank you. Thank you.